Okay, you said it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll tell you what. We'll just pass those out. Okay, let everybody see those. And uh, in fact, why don't you bring me one now? So I can mention this to people who are listening and watching who are in the area. You know, we do have a youth center next door. And this is the flyer for the summer program uh, for the William Jackson Youth Center. We operate from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Crafts, cooking, swimming, field trips, nature walks, Lego building, dance, video games, photography. Uh, so that's going to be happening starting on uh, what? This coming Monday or Tuesday or what? Well, anyway, call 458. That's right, is it four five eight? Yeah, I think I think that's wrong. Um, but at any rate, call the church. <laughs> or go to the call the call dot org um, and uh, and get information on our, our summer youth program. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right, well, this is Father's Day. I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers who are watching on Facebook. Amen. God bless you. We're glad Amen. you're with us. And we're getting tremendous response, by the way, on Facebook. Uh, thousands of people watching uh, on Facebook, and we're grateful to God for that. We pray that Facebook won't so dislike something I have to say that they decide that they're going to take me off. Um, so far, thank God that does, that has not happened, and we don't expect it to, or we certainly don't want it to. But you know, there is this big debate whether these big tech firms, uh, organizations, are platforms to allow people to have a free exchange of ideas, or they are controlled communication entities that only want the ideas that they agree with to be propagated. And Twitter, as you all probably know, Twitter banned me uh, a year ago now and said that they were suspending me pending appeal. I appealed, but somehow the appeal never got heard. Uh, so I've been off Twitter now for a year, and, uh, and a lot of people have faced the same kind of, of situation. I guess some have appealed, but I've not spent my time. I've, I've gone to Parler, which is a new Twitter-type platform that uh, that is more open to the free exercise of ideas and exchange of ideas, and I'm using them. But we'll see what the Lord does about Twitter. Uh, but these, these big tech folks need to be reined in and realize they are not the censors. People who get to determine who can be heard and who cannot. Uh, that's just not their role, and that's the role they're going to play. They're going to have to be regulated, like like uh, like the telephone company or or some other entity. If that's the role they think they're going to play, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. The scripture for today is in Psalm 22, verses four through five, and of course I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, "Our fathers trusted in you; they trusted, and you delivered them." They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Psalm 22, verses 4 and 5. I want to talk for a few minutes on this subject. Where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? So today is Father's Day, and before we get started, I, I want to talk to, of course, I'm going to talk about the importance of fatherhood, but before we get started, I want to dedicate this message to all of you fathers who are watching right now, to all of you who are here who are fathers, but I also want to dedicate it to a group that is being vilified today. I want to dedicate this message to the memory of our founding fathers, because I really believe that our founding fathers are being unfairly and unjustly vilified. Uh, and that they need to be honored for having bequeathed us the greatest nation mankind has ever known. Amen. And while people are busy tearing down their statues and defacing their statues, uh -huh. and even going after people like Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington particularly, will be next because a lot of people on the left don't like Booker T. Washington because he was a person who believed in self-help and do for yourself and and, and try to create as much independence for yourself as possible. That was his message to the black community. But to this day, he is vilified by people on the left as an accommodationist. So I'm wondering whether his statues 
uh, will be torn down and the, the, the university he started, Tuskegee University, will somehow be vilified as well uh, because he started in one of the great universities that produced the Tuskegee Airmen who were critical in World War II mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet his memory is, is often defamed. Mm -hmm. So I want to dedicate this message to all of those fathers, the founding fathers and fathers like Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King, fathers of our culture who I believe were interested in bringing us together as one nation rather than ripping us apart. Mm -hmm. And I know that may not be popular in some quarters, uh, but I, I feel all the better saying it for just that reason. Uh, <laughs> I also want to dedicate this Father's Day message to Donald Trump. Amen. Amen. Because you know, one of the ways Donald Trump doesn't get credit, Donald Trump has raised some wonderful children. Yep. And they're not perfect, but I'll tell you what, they're far cry from the self-destructive kids we often see of the rich and famous, um, the Paris Hiltons of the world. And, 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 and even many of the Kennedys who are dying of drug overdoses and, yep. and, and doing all kinds of vile things to, to, to bring shame on their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, Donald Trump's children have really been models of behavior. They, they've helped with their father's business to expand it and to grow it. They've started their own businesses. Uh, and I, I think it says a lot for him that in spite of the rap that people give him about his marriages and whatnot, but it says a lot for him that he has loved his children, cared for them, they love him, and are sticking by him. Uh, and so I want him to know that there are those of us who see that, observe that, and we appreciate that, because what we need are more fathers like that in our culture today. I also want to dedicate it to my own father, the late William Jackson, the, the youth center is named after my father, because my father was such an important factor in my life. I've said, other than Jesus himself, the person who most shaped who I am was my father, William Jackson. Uh, and my uh, wife and daughter were just saying, the older I get, the more I look like him. But, but I tell you, I, I don't just look like him. I think like him. I talk like him. <laughs> you know, in many ways, I'll, I'll see myself sometimes and go, that's Bill Jackson. Uh, so I, I want to I honor my own father. And then, of course, most importantly, to our Heavenly Father, Father God without whom we wouldn't even have a clue what being a father means. Amen. God is the perfect father. And I want to say to all of those who, of you who might be listening, and I know there are people watching right now who've been abandoned by their fathers. I'm going to get into that. I want you to know there is a father for you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Father God loves you. And, and you know, so often the, the, the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children in the sense that Whatever hurt and pain fathers have caused their children, those children tend to repeat. Uh, they yeah. tend to, to repeat the same destructive or self-destructive behavior that their fathers have foisted upon them by their abandonment or their neglect or their abuse. Uh, and I just want you to know the Father God is able to heal that. Amen. He's able to heal whatever abuse you suffered at the hands of your father. And you know, the thing is, it, it, it is nothing but the pollution of sin. That's all it is. It's the pollution of sin ruining people's lives. And as a result, that ripple effect affects generations yet to come. Uh, so we, we, we honor Father God today because he is the perfect model of what a father is. And we all need ultimately to look to him. I had a wonderful father, but he wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. He wasn't perfect. But my Father God is. Amen. 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 Father God is. Yeah. So let's begin at the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, you can go there, but I'm going to read it for you in the interest of time. Uh, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. What do you think when Adam awakens? Literally, with God in his face. What do you think is the first thing God said to him? Well, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But, but, but I believe we can come to a reasonable conclusion on the basis of another text that talks to us about what God says to Jesus when he again brings him into the world. And I believe it's, it, it boils down to this. When Adam awakens in the presence of God, comes into consciousness for the first time, what he hears God say is, I am your father, 
and you are my son. I am your father, and you are my son. He said, well, now, Bishop, how can you, why do you believe that? Because Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 says, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's what Jesus, that's what, that's what the father said to Jesus when he raised him from the dead. He says, and again he said to him. Because we know he was the son of God from the foundation, before the foundation of the world. He is God a very God. But he gave everything up for us. And the father says, but I will say again to him, you are my son today. I have begotten you. And I will again be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. I believe that's the first thing Adam heard. I am your father. And you are my son. And Jesus, by the way, is called the last Adam. So it makes sense that what God said to the last Adam is what he would have said to the first Adam. Amen? Amen. 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 So then the first lesson then that God has got to teach Adam, if that's the first thing Adam understands, you are my father, I am your son. God says, yes, I am your father, you are my son. Then the first lesson that God teaches is the lesson of relationship between father and child. That's got to be the first lesson. God created mankind to be the recipient of his love and to love him in return. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing God has got to teach Adam is, I love you. And I've made you so that you can love me in return. And so it begins with a love relationship between father and son. You know, God made us, by the way, not only capable of love, but with a need to love and be loved. Every human being has it. And when they don't get it, bad things happen. In fact, think about this. this is, I want you to remember this principle. The love of the father was the first love in the first man's life. He came later. The love of the father was the first love in the first man's life. Now just stop and think about that for a moment. That's the first love that the first man ever knew. And you've got men and women all over this country and the world for that matter who've been denied the very first thing that God intended for mankind. To know the love of the Father and to be able to give love to him in return. No wonder we've got such social problems. That need is deep, it's profound. But, 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 and, and, and look, remember we, we say love and, and because it's a word that is so overused in life. I mean, we use it all. I, I, I love that food. I love this car. I, you know, we just you overuse it. But we're talking about agape love, deep, profound, almost unfathomable, uh, uh, unconditional love. You know, God didn't stop loving Adam after he sinned. He still loved him. Because that was God's purpose for him, to, to love him and to be loved by him. It was Adam by the way, who lost his first love. Because once, of course, he sinned against God, he had a different attitude toward God. And by the way, when he was created, she became part of that love relationship. So, so she knew, she knew the love of God. See, I'm convinced that when Adam, when Eve was taken out of Adam, and Eve was, of, of course, given consciousness, she too knew first the presence of the Father. So she was taught the love of God too And then the love of her husband And the two of them Were partners in this love relationship With God Amen, you all getting this Amen. Praise God So, so and, and remember, so before sin They hear the father walking in the garden In the cool of the day And they would run to him Run to him And then after sin, they ran from him Just like children today if they know they've done something to please their father, they want to run to it. But when they think they've done something to make their father upset or angry, what do they do? They want to avoid it. 
And that's exactly what they did. But that need for love, for the love of a father, goes back to our very origins. And it's deeply ingrained in our, in our souls and in our psyche. We need it. And it's a major deficit in our culture today. In fact, notice the discussion Jesus had with the disciples when he told them he was about to leave them. Go to John 14. John 14. Look at verses 6 to 8. John 14. I want you to see this. It says, and you can catch up with me when you get there, but it says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you know what's interesting is that what Jesus is saying there is that my ultimate will is to usher you into the presence of the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the conduit through which you come into relationship with the Father. The relationship that Adam broke. I'm the one who comes and renews that relationship for you. Seventh verse, if you had known me, you would have also known my Father. For from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, and listen to this, and this is profound. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And you know what Philip is saying? Philip is saying, I do have a father deficit. Can I meet him personally? Just like people all over this country today, some of whom never met their fathers, never knew their fathers, don't, or became estranged from them at an early age, and, 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 and therefore don't really know them. They know they exist, but they don't really, and they, and they met them sometimes at a much earlier age. They know they're there, they know they're around, but they don't know them. And Philip says, Lord, I want to meet my father. I want to meet my father. And Jesus goes on to explain that he is the perfect reflection of the father. And when you meet him, you, in effect, meet the father. Amen. 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 At the beginning of the night, where Jesus said, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the work. Philip, you are not only seeing it, you are experiencing the love of the Father in what you see from me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so we want people to be reunited with the Father. Jesus is the only way for that to happen. Amen. 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 So when you meet Jesus, you meet the Heavenly Father because he's the perfect reflection and representative of who the Father God is. In fact, go to John 16. John 16, verse 26. And then I, 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 what I'm trying to underscore is how important this father relationship is. Have you ever considered this? Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And you got people running around changing the genders of the Bible. You know, they want to change Jesus' gender to the person, the person of God. And they want to change God the Father into I, I forget what they do, but they, there's a whole feminist Bible and a whole bunch of people say, we gotta, we got to de-gender. We, we got we to gotta make the Bible gender neutral. But you know, God chose to reveal himself as Father. Amen. He didn't do that. He didn't flip a coin. <laughs> Obviously, there's something that in, in his design for mankind and his plan and purpose for us in which he wanted us to understand who he is to us in his essence, and he revealed himself to us as father. Not his mother, but his father. Now we know that mother and father together represent attributes of God. Amen? Amen. Because God is nurturer. God is, is, is comforter. I mean, he's all of those things that we might associate normally with motherhood, but he revealed himself as father. So look at this. John 16, beginning at verse 26, Jesus says, In that day, 
you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And what Jesus is saying is that you are going to have intimate and personal connection to the Father too. Amen? Is that what he says? He says, I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. Do you know God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus? Amen. I mean, he's got to because he sent Jesus to, to pay the ultimate sacrifice for you. Amen. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 So look, the need for a father is a deep desire within every human being. And one of the greatest works of the devil is to destroy that relationship. That's, that's one of his supreme works, to destroy that, to destroy the family, to destroy fatherhood, to destroy what it means to be a father. When you hear all these feminist, crazy feminist ideas about the patriarchy of the family and and you read on Black Lives Matter website that, that we got to get rid of the Western nuclear family. All of that is straight out of the devil's playbook. Amen. Amen. That's demonic. Amen. Because the family is not a Western idea. It is a biblical idea. Amen. It's not an idea of white people or black people or Hispanic people or Asian people. It is God's idea for mankind. A bunch of people running around trying to racialize it, make it like it's some kind of, the feminists make it some kind of institution of slavery to enslave women and children. It's a tool of the capitalist society, Marxism would teach you. All of those are lies out of the very pit of hell. Amen. But that's, that's Satan's work. That's Satan's work. Because of anything God creates, he wants to destroy. Amen? Amen. 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 So look, a USA Today article written by a woman named Jaquela Mordecai, and she's not writing particularly from a Christian perspective, but I want, to, I want you to hear what she's got to say. She tells a story about her father and mother breaking up when she was about two years old, and that she saw him for a little bit of time after their breakup, but then ultimately he stopped contacting her. She lost track of him. She didn't see him anymore. And then in the ninth grade, she tracked down her, her, his, her father's mother and went to see her and when she went to see his, her father's mother she said, I, I'm going to call him so she called him and got him on the phone, now she has not talked to her father now since she was basically a toddler and now she's in ninth grade and here's what she says about what she was feeling, she said I developed an intense need to have my real father back I started to despise men I had a boyfriend, but he abused me, including throwing me against the subway window. So finally, in the ninth grade, she locates her father through his mother, and he calls her and puts him on the phone with her. And here's what she said. When I heard his voice, I couldn't help but become emotional. I consider it one of the best moments I had in my life. But after that, I rarely heard from him. No text messages, no phone calls, nothing. A postcard would have been fine. This stuff would bring you to tears. It said it would be almost six months later for me to finally know that he was still alive. It hurt inside because I thought he wanted to be a part of my life. At this point, my emotions went haywire. I needed to yell, I needed to go on a rampage. The more people don't understand, the more I wanted to get angry, which made me an outcast to society. They didn't know where happiness, where my happiness went. No therapy could tame me and no religious talk could save me. I was gone. Now that's, that's a young woman expressing what she felt like to be abandoned by her father. See, most social problems, come. she didn't go into detail because obviously she was doing some bad stuff before she got her life together. But most social problems come back to this issue, fathers abandoning their children. 20 million, one out of four children in America live without a father in the home, and many of those who live with a father in the home don't live with their biological father, and praise God for these stepfathers 
who's come in and will become real fathers to their children. God bless them. But you all know that in many instances, it doesn't work out that way. And even when it works out well, children still want to know their biological father. So fatherless homes produce 63% of youth suicides. And we have youth suicide climbing in this country. 90% of homeless and runaway children come, with, come from fatherless homes. 85% of all children with behavioral disorders. 71% of high school dropouts. The big thing about high school dropouts now, most of the dropouts are coming from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent drug addicts. 70% of juveniles in youth correctional facilities come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth offenders who graduate to adult prison come from fatherless homes. 80% of convicted rapists, fatherless homes. 70% of adolescent murderers, adolescent murderers have no father in the home. And here's perhaps the most damning point. The Journal of Marriage and Family, by the way, those statistics come from the Bureau of, uh, well, they come from several sources, but one is the Census Bureau report, uh, and some of them come from the, uh, you know, well, primarily the Bureau of Census, some from the National Principals Association report on the state of high schools, the Center for Disease Control, a number of other different sources, but all of these I have sites for. But the Journal of Marriage and Family reports that men who have been abandoned by their fathers are more likely than not to abandon their own children. And that women who have been abandoned by their fathers are more likely than not to choose men who will do the same to their children. So this thing is a generational curse that is being passed down from one generation to another. Look at this. Children from fatherless homes are five times more likely to commit suicide, 10 times more likely to abuse drugs, 20 times more likely to suffer mental illness, 20 times more likely to do hard time in prison, and 14 times more likely than a child from a two-parent family to commit murder. All this looting that's been going on in these riots, I guarantee you, you see the people who are doing that, and you trace that, you'll find out that there's no father in the home, or the father is in prison, or the father is a street thug like the kids, and that's where he learned it from. And by the way, here's an interesting fact. I've shared some of these statistics before, but here's an interesting fact that I just discovered. Because you know, I've had people say to me, because uh, you know, we're living in a world now where there's a lot of talk about systemic racism. And I had some people approach me and talk about the fact that um, black women are 2.5 times more likely to die in maternity than white women. By the way, here's an interesting thing that you don't hear much, but they're three times more likely to die in maternity than Hispanic women. Hispanic women have a better maternity health rate than white women for, for you know, so maybe maybe it's not systemic racism. But but I, I've heard this and 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 I said facetiously one time, somebody probably upset a little bit when I said it. I said, so what, what are they doing? Murdering them? Because you see, when you say, well, the reason is systemic racism, to me that's like the ghost in the machine explanation. You can't put your finger on anything, all you know is there's just, there's a disparity. An outcome, and therefore it must be that. But you know what's just interesting to me? That they don't ever apply that to abortion. 37% of the abortions performed in America are performed on black women, but somehow that's not racial. Well, that's because the devil's fooled everybody into believing that somehow, you know, abortions and the killing of unborn babies in New York, more black babies are aborted than more. But somehow that's okay. Well, no, that's not a racial issue. And so, you know, I would hear that, and I would go, hmm. And they, they have the concept of implied bias. And so it's implied bias. You know what that means? People don't know they're biased, but they are. So just kind of inherently, a nurse doesn't care as much about a black mother as she does about a white mother. And so she just doesn't attend her the same. Well, a doctor doesn't attend her the same. You can't prove that, but it's just kind of there. Yep. I'm always skeptical of those bone-hitting explanations because they really don't mean anything. Yep. Well, in my research for this message, I found out what the real answer is, and this is the answer that nobody wants to talk about. 
According to the Child and Family Research Partnership at the University of Texas, quote, absent fathers are three times more likely to have children with health complications as early as three months after birth. They are also more likely to have children born underweight. Perhaps not surprisingly, these health problems affect more than just newborns of birth absent fathers. They affect mothers too. Moms abandoned by the child's father, are more likely to experience complications during pregnancy or at the time of birth. Oh. So it's not just systemic racism. Well, what community has the highest number of abandonment by fathers? The black community. But you see, nobody wants to talk about this. You know why? Because that's something you can do something about yourself. And it's so much easier to say, yeah, those white folks. Now, you know, it's systemic racism. How about knucklehead men taking responsibility for the women they've been pregnant and doing their job as fathers? I don't have any patience with that mess. It goes on to say, quote, stress imposed on the mother by a lack of father involvement during pregnancy contributes to prenatal health complications that in turn compromise newborn health. Yeah, see, nobody wants to talk about this because that, this is not politically correct. It's scientifically true. And, and look, I don't know if I know with common sense. Anybody who is sick, being medically treated in any way, who has a strong support system around them is more likely to fare better than somebody who doesn't. Now, you can explain that all kinds of ways, but it's just a fact. And I don't think it has anything to do with race. In fact, uh, Sister Lee told me, and I didn't know this, she told me this years later, but my father was in a nursing home right here in Chesapeake, and, uh, and I would visit my father every day. If I was in town, I was going to see my father, period. Nothing was going to stop me from going to see him. And, and Sister Lee told me, she said, Bishop, you know, they used to talk about you, they say, you know, make sure Mr. Jackson's straight because you know his son's coming. <laughs> and I had no idea. He said, well, yeah, they said, his son, you know his son, and his son's going to be looking at them hard. <laughs> I mean, but think about the, parent, the person who doesn't have someone looking at for them, looking out for them, advocating for them, letting people know that they're loved. Well, if you've got a young girl who comes from a broken family, and the, and, the, and the man has, who's impregnated her has abandoned her, and she's kind of trying to navigate her, the health care system, and she's young anyway and doesn't know much. Well, the fact of the matter is, she is under far greater stress than somebody who's married, her husband's there, her family's there, they're watching, they're, they're, they're you know, he's going through all the prenatal uh, exercises and all the things that you got to do. Of course that person's going to fare better. And just like for men in prison, when you correct for broken families, and you know the number of white men in prison and the number of black men in prison from two parent families is very low and equal. Very few men in prison come from two parent families. Very few. So here again, studies show that even, even uh, 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 the, 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 the pregnancy process is affected by the absence of the father. So it starts from really from the moment of conception. Amen. So, uh, look, so God established relationship with Adam, and he built into us that need. And without that need, we're simply not going to be healthy people. Uh, except by the power of God intervening in our lives and, and helping us. Um, in fact, you all know my story. I mean, I was raised in foster care, and I can, you know, I, I tell people, I've been on both sides of this. I knew what it was to be without my father raising me and in my life in any significant way, and what it was like to be with my father raising me, and it's like night and day. I mean, it is like night and day. And I went from being a wild kid running the streets to basically being a scholar who was home and I was supposed to be home because I knew my father was not going to play. And my foster parents, God bless them. I mean, I, I really believe, particularly my foster mother, Miss Rebecca Molette, 
I named my little daughter after her. I believe she loved me, but she couldn't control me. She just couldn't. Once I got of age, boy, go out there, I'm going to get a switch. Yeah, right. I was gone. And I would literally negotiate with them. And they would, they would try to catch me, and they couldn't catch me. And so finally, I'd tire them out, and they would say, i say, well, I'll come home if, if I'm not going to get a beating. And finally, they'd be huffing about, okay, okay, come on home. And I'd walk, you know, a few feet away. And once I was clear, everything was all set, I'm all set, until the next time. Go out there in the shed kitchen. We're gonna, I'm going to be out there and whoop you. I'll go out the back door, go over the fence, and go on about my business. They couldn't control me. But I tell you what, my father could. Because when my father told me to do something, he got that look in his eye. And you know, my father told me one time, he said, son, and I, he proved this, because you know, I used to embrace him when he, when he, I, he would visit with me from time to time, and then when I went to live with him, I, I, my father was <clears throat> still relatively young, and he could, he could outrun me. And he would tell me, son, don't forget, I could outrun you. And if you run, it's going to be worse when I catch you. <laughs> so unlike them, I couldn't even run. <laughs> I remember one time I thought I was going to get it, and I turned around, I thought to run, I said, no, it'll only be worse. <laughs> Let me face the music. <laughs> but look, God established relationship with Adam, and then he established, established his order. In Genesis 2, verse 15 through 17, it says the following. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it, and the Lord God commanded the man. Commanded the man. See, Adam, I'm your father. You are my son. I love you. Adam, you will do what I tell you to do. He, he didn't make suggestions. He didn't say, can we negotiate this? He said, he commanded the man. Look, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Adam, if you disobey me, there will be consequences. That's part of the role of fatherhood. Amen. For children to know that there are consequences to disobedience. You can't raise children without that. Amen. Now, people can talk about what the best you know, way is to, to create those consequences. And, of course, we got a big debate now on whether corporal punishment is ever justified. I've always taught our churches, as I've ministered throughout the years, that Corporal punishment certainly should be a last resort, and it should not be used with anger. It should be used not to get your frustrations out. It should be used to teach the child the lesson you want to teach them. So therefore, it should be done calmly, not because you're trying to vent. But the Word of God says, spare the rod, spoil the child. The Word of God says it is okay, and that it can be done without abuse. Amen? Amen. To teach lessons. It ain't, look, and here again, parents don't want to do that. That's your choice. I mean, you, you feel you can succeed teaching your children. My wife and I said, if we had to do it over again, we would use the word of God a lot more. We would sit down and read the word of God and what it says and say, now here's why what you did is wrong. Yeah. We, would, we would use let the word of God correct children. Amen? Yeah. Because then you're getting, you're getting something into their hearts, not just the fear of the parent, but the fear of God. Amen. But nevertheless, Look, a corporal punishment was used on me. I came out all right. You make the child violent. No, you don't. No, you don't. I mean, that's, that's just a myth. Look, to the extent I was violent, I was violent because I was angry about the fact that my parents were not there, and I thought something was wrong with me, and I wasn't listening to anybody. No, I, I remember saying, well, if my father's not here to tell me what to do, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I remember saying that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And that was the attitude I had. And then when I went to live with my father, he taught me respect for authority. Why? Because he said, you will respect my authority. You will respect the authority of any adult. You will respect the authority of police officers and teachers and all of those people who are charged with overseeing you. And then if I had a problem with an adult, let me tell you something. If, I, if you were an adult and I was a child and you gave me a problem that made me feel threatened or seemed to be abusive, my father was coming to see me. 
So I didn't have to fight my battles. I didn't have to feel like, well, somebody hurts me, I've got to do something. If my father felt somebody mistreated me, he was coming to see you. I, I, I'll never forget it. Uh, we had a shop teacher. I can't remember the man's name now, but he, he was abusive. Now, he, he didn't touch me, but I saw him kick guys in the shin. Yeah. Um, I saw him, you know, literally throw guys onto the shop table and, and you know, I, I mean, strangle them. I'm serious. You know, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So I told my father what I saw going on. And my father said to me, well, son, if he ever touches you, you let me know. And I said, okay. So one day he got a little set with me and he put his finger in my chest and did like that. Mr. Jackson, da, 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 da. So I went home and told my father. I said, well, you told me to tell you if he ever touched me. I said, he put his finger in my chest. He said, okay. My father went up there to see it. <laughs> because he, after telling him he was kicking people's shins and choking folks, my father went to see him. And I remember I was sitting in the, in the principal's office. I didn't see him talk to the teacher. And I don't know when, I think they arranged that. But I was sitting in the principal's office with him. And my, I heard my father say this. He said, I fight all my son's battles. He said, and if somebody here, I, I teach him to respect your authority and respect the teachers. He said, but if somebody here hurts my son, I'm coming back and I'm not coming back to talk. Now I know you might be, ooh, but that was my father. But see what, see what assurance that gave me. I didn't have to fight teachers. I didn't have to disrespect teachers. I knew my father was going to take care of business. And you know what? Uh, I, I, I wish I could remember his name. He came to me later and apologized. The teacher. And I said, yeah, he must have talked to my daddy. <laughs> yeah, he, but my daddy was no joke. He could, he, could, cause look, he could look at you and get you straight. And, and so, see... But, but, but on the other hand, if I, if, if I told my father that I cursed the teacher or disrespected the teacher, then I would have been in trouble. Because he would tell me, that's not your job. You have a problem with an adult. You come see me. But see, where did these young guys go who don't have fathers in the homes? I mean, they, they, they feel, I'm, I'm on my own. I'll fight it out myself. So the respect that we once were taught for adults, that's gone. That is gone. I was, uh, I, when I was up, pastoring up in Boston, I watched as a gang of guys were harassing a young girl. And I mean, they were pushing her and taunting her. And it had to be five or six of them. And she was just, checked, just kept walking. And they finally hemmed her in so that she could not get by them. So I walked out, because I'm looking out the church window, and I walked out, and I said, what's going on? And I mean, none of your business. This is yeah, nothing, none of it. I mean, you know, you, you know, I'm a preacher coming out. And basically, what did they care? There was a time when the preacher came into a Mr. group. When I was growing up, we say, well, Reverend, so and so and so and so, and we move on. Because we were just taught to respect authority. Oh, they, you know, nah, uh, so while they're engaging with me, she calls her father. And I look up, and here he's coming down the street with his hand in his pocket, something bulging out. I'm thinking, uh oh. Let me back up, because I don't know what's going to happen next. Well, you know what? He came in with his little bulge, and they cursed him like they found him. And so, oh, you got something? We got something, too. And these kids couldn't have been more than 14, 15, 16 years old. That's what we're facing now. If my, my father heard that I talked to an adult like that, I might not have gotten out alive. I mean, he wasn't having it. But we're young people learning respect for authority now. Amen? Are you all hearing me? See, look, true love doesn't exist without order and accountability, does it? Not true love. True love can't just be a free-for-all. True love operates in, a, in an atmosphere of covenant and order and accountability. And that's what God is giving Adam. God is saying, I love you, you're my son, but look, there's some things I expect of you. John 14, 15, if you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. Don't tell me you love me to do whatever you want to do. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. He who has my commandments and keeps them loves me. And then in Matthew 24, 12, 
this passage about the end times, it says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Where there's lawlessness, there's no love. And that's why you see people walking up to, 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 to some, uh, uh, here again, some woman of, of a uh, young woman, of uh, American woman, of European background, some guy walks up there and says, my boss told me you need to get on your knees and apologize to me. That's vile. That's, that's vile. There's no love in that. That's lawless. So all this disorder we're seeing, the vandalism, the, the riots, the, the, the murders, nobody wants to talk about that either. The number of people killed since this whole congregation started when George Floyd lost his life. Tra terrible, tragic situation. But nobody talks about the fact all these other people were killed since then. Because that doesn't matter, because that doesn't fit the narrative uh, of uh, the, the Marxist political narrative that they're trying to, to sell, which is capitalism is bad, uh, America's bad, uh, all white people are white supremacists and racists, and all of that. So all these black people have died since they don't really matter, because the only thing that matters is the one that we can use. <sighs> Amen. You know, if I, even as a young man, done participating in some of this stuff, my, here again, my father would have slapped the snot out of me. Because <laughs> And, 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 and please hear me well, hear me well. One of the reasons why I so honor my father. First of all, my father taught me, son, you earn what you get. You don't steal from people. You don't take things from other people. You don't take advantage of weak people. You don't take what doesn't belong to you, what you haven't worked for. And, and, and you know, my father was a man of his word. He taught me lying was one of the worst things you can do. You don't lie. You don't steal. You don't cheat. That was my father's ethic, and that, that, was, that was the way he raised me. I'm not saying I, I lived it out perfectly, but I had that deeply ingrained in me. In fact, I'll tell you something. If you accuse my father of stealing a lie, you better be ready to fight. Because he's probably going to fight you. Because he, he, my father taught me, son, men don't steal what doesn't belong to them. Not real men. Amen. People who do that are not men. And my father used to say to me, and so look, if you get out here and somebody tries to hurt you, and you, you defending yourself hurt them, I'm going to be right there for you. In fact, he used to have a saying, he said, the son, always remember, you can come back from the hospital. I mean, you can come back from jail, but you can't come back from the morgue. But you know what he would also say? He said, but if I find out you're out there robbing and stealing and hurting people to try to get something that doesn't belong to you, don't even call me. Right. Now, I don't know whether he meant that or not, but I'll tell you what, he put the fear of God in it. He said, don't even call me. He said, because that's beneath you, and I'm not going to respond to that. He said, you want to be around me, you stay out here where I am, and you do what I do. You see me breaking the law, you see me running around and doing criminal things, well, then don't you do it either. My father never taught me the cops are out to get you. He taught me, you behave yourself. And you treat others with respect. And you respect the property of others. And you won't have the problems that some people have. And I do. Amen. Here again, as a black man in America, I'm not allowed to say that. Because, well, now, wait a minute. Are you saying black men are never abused by the cops? I can't speak for all black men. I can only speak for me. But I know one thing. If you are not out there doing what you've got no business doing, the likelihood of your having a problem with cops drops to virtually zero. Amen. Now look, I, 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 I don't in any way uh, want anybody to lose their lives, but, but let's face it, Ray Shard Brooks had a history of problems. Yep. A history of problems. And, we, and, and nobody wants to say this either. If he had simply submitted to the arrest, he'd have gone home that following morning. Amen. Not about to say that. But you, you, instead, you want to send the message out this idiot at CNN said, out, well, he fought because we learned that if you don't fight the cops, you die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's insane. Yep. Yeah. It's exactly the opposite. Yep. If you treat the police with respect and you comply, you are going to be 
be fine in almost all cases. Amen. But if you decide you're going to fight cops, don't expect things to end well for you. True. Amen. Don't expect, I mean, that, that, that's, just, that's just crazy. Yep. But you see, when, when, when the relationship with Father God is broken, and then add the, the relationship with your father, your earthly father is broken, where's the order? Where's the sense of decency? Where's the respect for authority going to come from? And by the way, God bless all the single mothers out there who have raised good children. But it, look, it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle. And God bless them for having done so, for having worked hard and, and been father and mother. I understand that because my father used to say, I've got to be father and mother to you. So I, I, I understand that perfectly. I'm not taking anything away from that. But that's not God's best. That's not God how that, that's not how God designed things to be. Amen? Amen. 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 And so so we get the, the, the crazy, lawless stuff that we see happening right now. For example, in the autonomous zone of Seattle, of course, it's a no cop zone, right? Cops are allowed. What? You know, cops are allowed. By the way. I don't know whether you're all aware of this, but this is true. This is the way the autonomous zone operates. Only Native American, black, and trans women may be in authority. Yes. Only Native Americans, blacks, and trans women may be in authority. Whites may serve and perform rituals of atonement. And you've got corporations giving money to Black Lives Matter. What is wrong with that? What is wrong with people? <laughs> they were trying to rip the country apart. And, and look, I told you all, this stuff is much more like a cult yeah. than it is a political movement. Right. It's like a, a devilish cult that's got in the minds of people. And check this out. In Seattle, they've got something called a agricultural project in one of their parks, and they've got a big sign up in front of it saying, this garden is for black and indigenous folks only. White people may work in it, but they may not eat of it. I, I thought that that's what we had fought to end. And instead, what we're seeing is the reverse. But here again, see, that's the devil. That's the devil. And I said the same thing. And, and, and look, I don't know how the a jury is going to find in the case of this officer, Garnett, but this man was charged with felony murder. That's the same charge you bring against somebody who goes to rob a gas station and kill somebody, goes to rob a bank and kill somebody, goes to carjack and kill somebody. You charge them with felony murder, meaning that they might not have intended to kill, but since they were committing a felony and they kill someone in the process, they're charged with felony murder, and felony murder carries a death penalty. And that's what Garnett was charged with. Mm. Felony murder. They said, we're not going to seek the death penalty, but he could spend life in prison without the possibility of parole. He didn't, he didn't go there looking for trouble. He went there at the dispatcher's call. And for a long time, it seemed to go fine, and things did not go south until Rayshard Brooks began to fight and resist arrest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the prosecutor, when he made the presentation, acted like that never happened. He said Rayshard was cooperative and quote unquote jovial. <laughs> and, and you know what I said, and I, I'll, I'll say it here because I think it needs to be said. To me, it's nothing but politics and payback. Yep. Politics and payback. You did it to us, now we're going to do it to you. God's going to smile on that. God's going to bless that. But this is what happens when people reject the authority of Father God. See, the same Father God who made me made you. Whatever the color of your skin, whatever your background, he made you and loves you. How in the world do I think I am to say, well, you're less than I am because of the pigment in your skin or the melanin in your skin or whatever. I mean, that, that's, and yet even the church is buying into this stuff. That's right. That's right. Come on. Come on. And you know, and the thing is, just like on, in the autonomous zone, you know, they've been saying, we down with the borders and open borders, but they've got borders and it's on the zone. And, and, and we, we got too many guns, but the guards have guns and they're on the zone. Which, which proves the point that the revolution, particularly this Marxist stuff that they're trying to sell us, 
always gives you something worse than what they claim they're liberating you from. Because what I want to know is, well, who elected you? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> they appointed themselves because they had the guns. They said they got a warlord there who's passing judgment on everybody. And you all probably saw this craziness. All the white people here give $10 to any black person you can find. But first of all, I wouldn't be involved in a mess like that anyway. But, but if you're stupid enough to be involved, you ought to be smart enough to realize, what's $10 going to do? Say what? Oh, to me, I'm thinking, now, you know, if you really want to be bold, I said, if you want to follow your revolution to its logical conclusion, what you ought to say, bring your deeds to your houses and bring your, your uh, 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 the ownership of your cars and I want you all to sign those over to your victims, but you keep paying the bills. Because after all, that's the least you can do. I wonder how many people would still be left there. Well, maybe the people, they don't have any houses, so it, might, it may not be an issue. But I mean, this, this is just, this is insanity. Oh, and by the way, they said, you know, they're taking it back because after all, we stole it from the Native Americans in the first place. Well then, from, that, from my perspective, everybody ought to leave but the Native Americans. Right. You, nobody else has a right to be there. Come on. Yep. I, I mean, but, but here again, see, you know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced a lot of these people are angry with their daddies. Yeah. I'm serious. I'm convinced a lot of them are angry with their daddies. Like, like children having tantrums. My father didn't like love me. My father didn't pay attention to me. I'm going to get back at America. I'm going to get back at the father of the country, George Washington. I'm going to tear his statue down. I'm going to tear out everything that this country represents. I really believe that's Colin Kaepernick's problem. Not having his own father there to love him and affirm him. And now he's angry with the world. And of course, he's got plenty of reason to be angry. It's only worth about $100 million. So, you know, clearly he's pressed. I mean, see, when fathers abandon their children, the children have a harder time finding their place in the world. Right. It's like that woman I just read you, how she, she's angry. She said, I wanted to fight somebody. I wanted to hurt somebody. And, and look, my father was a wonderful man, but I remember one major difference between living in foster care and living with my father and I can tell, tell you what it is because I was conscious of it. You know what it was? When my father took me out of foster care and took me to live with him, I suddenly believed that I was loved and had value. My foster family, as, as wonderful as they were, for, and I'm not saying this, this is true for all children, it was true for me. They could not give me what I needed because I felt, where's my mother? Where's my father? Why, why aren't they around me? All my friends pretty much, a lot of them had only their mothers, but, but some of them had their mothers and their fathers there, but I didn't. And when my father came back into my life, I can remember, I still get emotional about it. I can remember laying in my bed at 12 years old. My father would come in and lay his hand on my head and just stay there for a second. And I could just, I would be awake, but I could just remember how that made me feel. I mean, my father loves me. My father loves me. And see, a lot of these children, they're crying, a lot of these people running around, they're crying out for love. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why spiritual fathers are so important today. Because in a sense, we've got a vacuum to fill for people who've never known the love of their biological father. They need to know that they're loved. They need to know that they're affirmed. By the way, this is men and women. Because men go looking for male affirmation in all the wrong places, and women go looking for love in all the wrong places, and they end up in exactly the same place that their fathers left them. Raising children without fathers, angry with the world, not being able to find their place in the world. And Malachi 4, 5 and 6 says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And look at one of his primary missions. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. You know what God is telling us? He's telling us that as we get closer to the end, there's going to be more and more father abandonment. All right, all right. I mean, you, how can you not read it that way? Amen? Amen. If, 
if, if, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, somebody's going to have to preach to people that fathers got to come back to their children, and children have got to acknowledge and forgive their fathers yeah. and reconcile with them. Amen? Amen? So what this is saying is the absence of a father brings a curse. It brings a curse. Like, who am I really? Well, if, you, if you're a man and you, you grow up learning to hate your father, well, maybe you're not a man. Maybe you were really meant to be a woman because those men are really bad. Like you heard this, this young lady say to Kayla, as I read earlier, she said, I, I began to hate all men. Well, what, what do you, uh, look, don't you know there are a lot of people who are women who are lesbians? who have that attitude about men because they've been hurt by a man and they think, well, the answer is, I, you know, men don't really know how to love and men don't, can't be relied on. Uh, I've got to find somebody, I've got to find a woman. And before you know it, they're all caught up in that. And these transgenders, wanting to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a man on the outside, they're saying, but I'm really a woman on the inside. You trace a lot of this stuff back, it goes back to molestation. It goes back to absence of fathers. It goes back to, to, to the way these people have been raised. And they're, 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 they're mentally and morally and, and, and sexually confused. And what they really needed in their lives was a father to help them find themselves. Amen. 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 But the presence of the father brings the blessing. Other than Jesus, the reason why I've been successful in my life to the extent I've been, other than Jesus, because I mean, he is the primary reason, Amen. but other than Jesus, it's the values my father gave me that allowed me to become something worthwhile and to do something worthwhile. Because my father was the one, my, and please hear this, my father never once told me, son, I wish you could be something, but you know the racist won't let you. And the white folks won't let you. And the system won't let you. So son, just be a bum. Because that's all they're going to let you do anyway. I, I mean, I've never heard anything like that. My father told me, and in fact, I was saying to a friend of mine who, who has this joke when I was running for lieutenant governor, a friend of mine, Don Westfall, used to get up in front of people and say, he would give my resume, he said, oh, and by the way, he also walked on the moon. And people would say, what? And then he would say, well, no, he didn't really walk on the moon, but you know, I, and, and that would be his little joke. But you know, my father used to say, and I told him one time, I said, you know, it's interesting you use that. I said, because my father used to say, son, reach for the stars. He said, and even if you don't make it to the stars, he said, you'll land on the moon. He said, but you'll be a whole lot further along than if you don't reach at all. Amen. That's the way I was taught. I wasn't taught, well, they won't let you, so no, what's the point? And my father said, be the very best at what you do. My father was a third class welder at Sunship Building and Dry Dock Company. And because of the way he was raised, you know, my father was raised in an era when if you were left handed, that was considered a curse. So we needed to get rid of that and teach you to be right handed. Well, you know, a lot of people thought that. And so my father was raised that way, and what it did, it made him ambidextrous. My father was one of the only welders in the whole shipyard who could weld with either hand right. equally well. Right. And he said when you had jobs that needed a left-handed welder and they didn't have them, they would come to him and say, well, well, Bill Jackson, you can weld with either hand. Well, he said, yeah. And they would give him the job. And he would say, son, he said, I know that I don't get the recognition I should get for the job I do. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. My father said this to me. He said, when I step back from a job I do and hit that slag, I guess the slag is the, is the extra well and falls off, he said, I look at that job, he said, there's nobody who could do it better. <laughs> and, then, and that's the way I was taught. I was taught, be excellent. Be, do the very best you can be. Don't, don't, don't half step in anything. Amen. But I was never thought this victimization in all the world's against you and all son. I just wish. I just, and my father only had a sixth grade education, but he filled me with hope and possibility for the future. Where are the fathers who are doing that for their children today? All right, all right. As opposed, I mean, and frankly, some of these so-called father types like LeBron James and Spike Lee and, and a lot of these other folks who are famous are instead filling people with hopelessness. Telling what you can't do, and the system's against you, and they won't let you, and the police are out hunting down black men. All this ridiculous nonsense. Yep. Instead of 
to tell them, get an education. Find out what your gifts are. Pursue that. My father used to say this to me. Son, there will be people against you as you go along for a variety of reasons. They may be jealous of you. They may not like you, whatever. He said, but you know what? He said, when people find out you want to do something with your life, help will come from unexpected places. Amen. He always told me, you, you just go be about doing something with your life. He said, there will be people who will see that, and he said, they will come along and help you. But instead, what we're sowing in, in, uh, these young people today is a bunch of, of, of hopelessness. The, the, the presence of a father brings hope. It brings vision. It brings possibility. It brings a willingness to accept responsibility. Yeah, I, I can't tell you, you know, when, when my wife and I got married, and I, I went out to California on the orders from the Marine Corps, and I told my wife, I said, I'm going to send for you. And uh, at the time, my, my in-laws didn't even know me that well, but they kind of, I later learned, they kind of said, yeah, right, yeah, they're going to send for you. Yeah, okay. You know, young man, right, he's gonna go out to California. I went out there, I think it took me about a month, maybe a month and a half. I went out, found an apartment, filled it with groceries, and bought a little car, and told my and sent my wife a ticket and said, Come on, come on out, we're ready. And I guess maybe they said, he did? She said, Yeah, I'm going. And that was it. But that that's because the way I was raised. I wasn't raised to to run from your responsibility. I was raised to, to fulfill your responsibility. Amen? Amen. 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 We, we need to teach young people that today. Yeah. Praise God. Look, yeah. we live in the greatest nation on earth to live and work and fulfill your God given potential and raise a family and do good things in life. And you got a bunch of people running around telling people this is the worst place in the world. So so let me let me just end with giving you three things. That we got to do to correct this. And I don't want to say all this and then not, well, well, Bishop, what do we do about it? Because, I mean, how do you rebuild families? Well, it's going to take a while to get it done, other than a miraculous move of God. It's just going to take a while to rebuild families, but it's got to be done because without that, we're not going to see progress in all these other social issues we've got. Amen. So here's what I would suggest. Number one, churches have got to preach it. Amen. Churches have got to preach it. Amen. we got to preach the importance Amen. of fatherhood and not go along with this nonsense that we're hearing in the world about toxic masculinity and the patriarchal family and, and all this craziness that we're being told about somehow men need, listen, what, my wife will tell you, one of my favorite shows, I watched it when I was growing up, now Father Knows Best. Yes. <laughs> That's my show, <laughs> I love that program. In fact, I just watched one where uh, the, the father character, Robert Young, comes in and the whole family just gets around him. Well, now the family, the father is a matter of ridicule. He's, he's a subject of ridicule now. He's a joke. He's a joke. Uh, and, and besides that, who needs a father and a mother and children? We gotta have two homosexuals now. I mean, that's that's it. Yep. But he comes in and the father just surrounds him, and his son Bud looks at this, and after all, he comes and taps his father and says, He said, Dad, he said, Yes, son. He said, How do you do it? He said, You what? He said, You walk in. And everybody just surrounds you. Everybody, everybody just loves you. And he says to them, son, it takes some time to find your place in the world, but you'll find it. Amen. I love that program. We, we, need, we need more programs like that because it's jumping against your children. So churches need to preach it. But then schools need to teach it. You know what that means? Get your children out of public schools because they're not going to teach them that. They're not going to teach them that in public schools any longer. That's done. They're going to teach them in public schools now. Oh, you don't know whether you're a boy or a girl. Give yourself a chance. Experiment. We're just tomorrow. That'll really impress everybody of how open you are. That will show you diversity and inclusive and in inclusiveness. And you're home teaching your child that you're, you're, you're a man. God made you a man. God made you a boy. And, 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 and he goes to school and tells him, well, no, no, wait a minute, that's, that's abusive. That's abusive. What you ought to do is tell your parents, change your birth certificate to say indeterminate. I mean, get, get your children out of these places. They, they, they are no longer serving our society. They are degenerating the society. And God bless the, the, the good teachers who are there, but they're caught up in the system that already has an agenda controlled by 
Brother Teachers Union, and the agenda is every leftist idea you can think of. So, but, but, but homeschooling, we start our home, little, home, little homeschool academy here, and, and Christian schools, and make sure it's a Christian school with a classic yes. educational model, because some of these Christian schools can go off the boards too. And, so, well, you know, as we, our, as the school we sent our children to once told us, well, now, wait a minute, not everybody goes here as a Christian, and we said, well, we don't care. Mm -hmm. we, we brought our children here because we wanted them to have a Christian education, and anybody who doesn't want a Christian education, go somewhere else. Right. Don't water down the curriculum, because not everybody's a Christian. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of nonsense, that oh, weak, cowardly mess that you get in some places. You don't want that for your children. You want a place that we are, we are a Christian school, that's our identity, that's what we're going to teach, Christian worldview, and if that's not what you want, then you don't want your child here. Right, right. Amen? Amen. 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 And, and then families need to emphasize it. See, it's, we could once assume that our children would absorb this by osmosis, but now the world is so hostile to it that you've got to be explicit about it. You gotta tell, you you gotta be able to tell children, no, boys grow up and become fathers, girls grow up and become mothers, and no, you're not gonna grow up and become a woman. I mean, no, no matter what Bruce Jenner says, and 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 no, your sister's not gonna grow, grow up and become a man, no matter what they told you on television. Uh, no, son, God made male and female. That's it, and that's all. Amen. And then you don't want to send them into a school environment where they say that and they're ridiculed. Uh -huh. What? Who told you that? Well, that's bigoted. That's hateful. No, that's the truth. Amen. 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 So where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? I want to encourage people, particularly in the black community, although this is spreading all over the country now, it has affected every demographic, but it's most acute in the black community. I want to encourage people in the black community to say, I will reject anything that militates against strengthening families and therefore restoring fatherhood to its rightful place of importance in the lives of children. And if you believe that, you will reject Black Lives Matter because they have the opposite view. Wow. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me stop. Stand up on your feet. Let's give God praise. Thank Hallelujah. you, Jesus. Glory to God. I want to take a moment and pray for fathers, and uh, as I do that, I'm going to, to move into a, a confession of faith in Jesus Christ, because, look, we have a deficit of fatherhood, but we know even a father who wants to be a good father is never going to be perfect, never going to be perfect, but Father God is perfect. He's the ultimate model of fatherhood. And he's the one that we ultimately look to to understand how we as fathers should behave. So I want to pray for fathers all over this country right now. Because we need a revival of fatherhood. We need a restoration of the importance of fatherhood in our culture. We don't need more transgenderism. We don't need more homosexuality. We don't need more feminism and, and concepts of toxic masculinity. That's, that's toxic to the entire culture and the future of our nation. I said, I think one of the reasons why people have such a, a problem with Donald Trump, and I mean, we know Donald Trump's not perfect. We know that, but no president ever has been. But one of the reasons people have trouble with him in this day and age is he's a little too masculine for them. You know, if he would drape his wrist a little bit, sashay a little bit, they'd like him a, little, a lot more. Yeah, I know. But let men be men and women be women. I mean, my goodness gracious. You say, well, Bishop, get in touch with your feminist side. I say, I did. I married her. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So I want to pray for, for men and fathers today. Uh, men who are not yet fathers who might become fathers. I want to pray for men who, not only biological fathers, as bi biological fathers, but men as spiritual fathers. Take, take young Christian men under your wing, or take young men under your wing and, 
disciple them and teach them what it means to be a man and teach them the, uh, to, to reject the lies they're being told in the culture about fatherhood and about manhood. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for Father's Day. Thank you that we live in a country that honors Father's Day. A few years ago, I heard some noises that we needed to do away with Father's Day and do away with Mother's Day and just have, I forget what they called it, personhood day, because they don't, they don't want to acknowledge any difference between fathers and mothers. But Lord God, may, may the celebration of motherhood and fatherhood persist, because we know that you had a design and you gave different roles to each gender. The father doesn't make one gender better than another. It doesn't make put one gender in a position to lord it over another. It's simply your order. In the same way you told Adam, Adam, I am your father, you are my son. And I command you. You just established order. You made Adam the head of the household, and, and he wasn't to lord it over and abuse his wife and children. He was to be a loving leader following you first and foremost. And so, Lord God, Please restore to our country honor for fatherhood and acceptance of it as your design and rejection of all of these specious, fallacious ideas about men and about fatherhood and about the family. And Father God, we pray that you'll strengthen men because we realize men, men are really up against it. I, and Lord, I do want to pray and I know this, this might strike people as wrong, but, it, but it's right because of the, of the circumstances we are in. Lord, I, I do want to pray for white men. And I, and I say that, Lord, because that seems to be the group now that it's okay to vilify and it's okay to denigrate. Uh, that somehow there's something inherently wrong with them. And Father God, we know that's a lie. There is none righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nothing any more wrong with white men or black men or, 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 or Hispanic men or Asian men or, 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 or women or anybody else that the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cure. And that's what we all need. And what we don't need is to be pointing the racial finger at each other and saying, well, you're bad because... And then using some racial or demographic identity to to denigrate people, like they're doing out of this, this ridiculous autonomous zone. Trying to, after claiming to want to get rid of second-class citizenship, now trying to make some people second-class citizens on the basis of their skin color. If it was wrong before, it's wrong now. And so, Lord God, help us to restore fatherhood so fathers can instill in their children a biblical worldview. As son, every human being is an individual and deserves to be treated with the respect that individuals should get as a, as a person that God created and that you shouldn't treat people differently on the basis of the color of their skin and you couldn't, shouldn't draw those conclusions and that women are a gift of God to, to, to man and to, and to the family and they should be honored and respected, not abused, not misused, not mistreated. And Father God, that the family is your construct. It is, not a, it is not a construct of slavery, although some people might try to make it that. That doesn't make the institution bad. That just means that some people are bad. But Lord, we know there are abusive people in every walk of life. That doesn't make the, the, the institution wrong. We know there are people in the church who abuse the authority of the church. But that doesn't mean the church wrong make the church wrong. That just means that some people get involved and try to use it for their own purposes. Help us, Lord God, to see the difference and to uphold the values that your word gives us against all onslaughts. And Lord, that men are supposed to be propagators of those values, leaders for you, like Adam was supposed to be. And unfortunately, Lord, he abdicated and messed it up, and then blamed his wife for it. So help us, oh God, help us to take as men and fathers our rightful responsibility. Help men to be spiritual fathers to young men who desperately need a father figure in their lives. Lord, the older I get, the more I see myself as a, a spiritual father uh, for some of these young men. Lord, help me to have an impact 
on the lives of young men, especially those who may desperately need a father figure in their lives because their fathers have been absent. To give them hope and vision and a sense of personal responsibility and right versus wrong. And Father God, just bless fatherhood in the land. May there be a revival of fatherhood in America. And Lord, as a result, a revival of the family as you intended and created it in our country, Lord. Because we know that if the family is strong, all of our institutions will be strengthened thereby. And if the family is strong and is promoting the right values, we'll come together as a nation instead of being torn apart by these anti-family, anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-American forces that are trying to lead us in the wrong direction right now. So Father God, we commit fathers and fatherhood into your loving care. And Father, if there's anyone today watching on Facebook or here, Lord, may they come to know Jesus Christ in a very real way, who is the only way to the Father. I said, no one comes unto the Father but by me. And Lord God, in the name of Jesus, may we restore the relationship with the Father for all of those who are still under the sin of Adam, still in rebellion, still running from Father God, like Adam did when he was first discovered after having sinned. But Lord, may they come to know that the first love that man ever knew was the love between father and child. The love between Father God and Adam's son. And so Father God, restore that so that we can be a healthier, more productive, prosperous nation for the future. You said without that, you'll smite the earth with a curse. And Lord, the curse is running rampant. Help us to correct it by preaching about this, teaching about this, and emphasizing this in our own families. So Lord God, may those who are watching, those who are listening, come to know Jesus Christ in a very real way. Surrender to him, confess their sins, confess him as Lord and Savior, confess that he died on the cross for their sins and rose on the third day that they might have a right to the tree of life that they might have access to the true and perfect Father, Father God. And Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May you be a blessing.